Welcome to map time. Just let some people get in here. I'm glad to see you all arriving. Uh, again, this is um, I don't know who that is. Sorry, this is uh, map time. I'm David Weimer. I'm a curator. I uh, curate the collection at the uh, Harvard Map Collection, and we'll be talking with Marcy Bidney, who's the curator of the American Geographical Society Library um, and assistant director of libraries at the University of um, Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And Hey, Marcy. Hey, Dave. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. You got some nice lights in the background there. You know, I'm trying to make the background a little jazzed up for people. Yeah, it's good. It's pretty um, much what everybody sees. <laughs> yep. Um, so welcome to Map Time. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Um, and so today, Marcy's going to be talking some a little about um, a cool uh, explorer uh, in Greenland, uh, cool in both senses. And uh, so her name was Louise Arner Boyd. And um, before I bring up a couple of maps, why don't you just tell us a little about her and, uh, and what her deal was, and then we can look at some maps that, that she was involved in. Sounds good. Uh, so when you asked me to do this, I'm going to take it like one step back and just talk about why I chose Louise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you asked me to do this, you asked to talk about maps. That's a pretty daunting task, given the collection <laughs> of maps that I get to oversee uh, every day. Uh, and just so I just started to try to think about how to narrow it down and to highlight the, the breadth and depth of our collections, and then to be able to talk about how our collections get used. Uh, and I kind of narrowed down on Louise because her collections that we have in the AGSL uh, span uh, all three, uh, four parts of our collections that we have, because we're not just a map collection, but it's also a really great way uh, to talk about the history of the AGS as well, uh, because we can't talk about the AGS library without talking about the history of the AGS. Uh, so she fits all of those uh, items. And, and so I was like, okay, Louise it is. There are certainly way cool maps that I could be talking about, but Louise in and of herself is a really way cool lady. Um, and so we're gonna focus on her, we're gonna look at some maps and we're gonna look at some photographs, some photographs mm -hmm. as well, and then talk about some really cool projects uh, that are using Louise's collections that we have. Mm -hmm. So Louise herself was the heiress um, to her family's fortune and her family's fortune was built uh, in gold mining. Uh, all of her immediate family passed away by the time she was fairly young. Uh, and so it allowed her the freedom to have a lot of money and do whatever she wanted to do with that money. Uh, and so instead of being a lady of leisure with that money, she chose to be a lady of adventure. And certainly uh, as part of those adventures, there was a lot of leisure <laughs> um, involved. Her, her expeditions were known to have um, quite extensive meals on ships, et cetera. So she used the money not only to sponsor the scientific expeditions that she went on, but to fund them well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in, in doing that, so her, her first foray into the Arctic region was in 1928 she, as, a, as a tourist. She just went um, on a cruise uh, to Norway, and it really kind of uh, solidified her love of the Arctic. And she decided to start going there because she could. She took her money, she hired some ships, uh, sailed around. And, and initially, her goals were just kind of fun. Some of them were to hunt polar bears, unfortunately. Um, 
but then also once that started happening, she, she saw the beauty of the land and decided that she wanted to turn it into a more scientific type expeditions. Uh, so by the late 1920s, she was going to the Arctic and specifically Greenland on a very regular basis. Uh, and so how does this all relate to the maps that we're going to talk about today is that when Louise went to Greenland, she chose very specific places that not a lot of people had gone before. And through her scientific expeditions, she was able to uh, collect data, take photographs, uh, and uh, motion pictures, video, we'll call it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> she wasn't walking around with a video camera, mm -hmm. uh, or she was like for a 1930s video camera. Uh, and they were really meticulous in their scientific observations and recordings, and were able to make really detailed maps of Greenland. And some of the maps that we're going to look at now are some of the first maps um, made of these particular areas. So the maps that we're going to look at are, um, there's there are maps of glaciers and sur so surveys of the east part of Greenland and then also a hydrographic survey of, the, uh, of, a, of that region as well. Uh, and so to tie it into the history of the AGS, uh, Louise certainly was a rich woman and she could go and she, can hi she could hire whoever she wanted. But because she was a woman, she needed to uh, have some legitimacy behind her because uh, science and women in, in that day weren't uh, very well connected. And so she hooked up with the AGS uh, to lend her expeditions some um, legitimacy. So the AGS helped find scientists and hydrographers and all of the people who went along on her expeditions and she footed the bill. She paid for every single expedition she took. So the, the AGS, it was just easy. They just had to put their name on it. And then when she came back from all of these expeditions, the AGS published all of her books. She wrote three books, all published by the AGS. And then the, the two maps that we're going to look at today uh, were also created in the AGS. So the American Geographical Society, uh, had the giant library, which I am in charge of, but in the 1930s, uh, they were also um, an organization that created maps. They were, they hired um, and employed many cartographers and were a huge map making um, organization. So these maps highlight the, the science that Louise collected, um, the detail with which that science was collected uh, and the skill of the cartographers uh, employed by the American Geographical Society because you can look at these maps and despite the fact that they're scientific maps, they're really quite gorgeous. Um, at least I think so. I'm partial yeah. to more scientific type maps. People will always ask me what my favorite map is. Um, I'm often pointing to um, a wind and current chart by uh, Maury, because I love them. I love the science behind them. Um, and so it's what I like about these two maps that we're going to look at uh, today. It's the science that went into making them. The fact that these were the, some of the first maps, if not the first maps made of this area of Greenland by Western people. Um, and the, the level of detail that they show. Yeah. So why don't we pull them over? Up? Let's see. Uh, let's see what I can do. So um, why don't we start with this guy? So okay, perfect. That's the one that I have. Of, yeah. Uh, one of the one of the maps. Um, so this so map has a. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. What are we looking at? What, what uh, are we looking at? Yeah. So there's a lot going on on this map, uh, which uh, is great. So the title of the map is "Detailed Surveys in East Greenland," and they were from. Um, one of Louise's expeditions. It was published in 1948. Um, one of the great things about Louise is that she kept copyright of her uh, maps. So despite the fact that they were uh, drawn and published by the AGS, um, she held the pub she kept the, um, the copyright to them. That was just a little aside. Uh, so 
there's a lot, there's, there's so much going on. Uh, on the right hand side, you, and the, you've got it up there on the screen, um, is the, excuse my pronunciation, <laughs> the Carol Fjord. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm highlighting this particular Fjord because it'll relate to something that we're gonna look at in a couple of minutes. But you can see the, the long, I'm gonna point to my, to my screen, but nobody can see that I'm pointing to the map. But on the left-hand side of the screen, if you're looking at it, um, is this fjord. And the, the, it's a hydrographic survey of the fjord, so it's showing how deep it goes. So they uh, used uh, sounding methodologies to drop wires into the, to the water to determine how deep the fjords are, and then they recorded that information. Uh, and so it, it's, it's really detailed. And one of the great things uh, about these maps is that when we, we can see, we have, we have particularly one uh, manuscript map that we'll look at as part of a web map that was developed uh, that kind of de details some of this information and details some of the information where some of the photographs were taken. But this particular map in general is just, it's kind of a hodgepodge of different scientific information about this particular um, area of Greenland. And it, it, it captures a snapshot of what Greenland looked like in 1948 which is very important to scientific research that's happening today particularly around climate change, where we're talking about uh, melting uh, um, glaciers, et cetera. So here's a snapshot that we have that shows that particular fjord, a couple of ponds, some other glaciers, so they, can, they, can, um, they know what size the glaciers were in 1948 uh, and can be used as comparisons to whatever the glaciers could possibly be today. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I like about this map um, is that it's showing, it's trying to show a region um, and the kind of these, like you're saying, these scientific aspects about it, but to do that, it has to show it at a lot of different scales and from a lot of different perspectives. Um, and I think that can help remind us that um, of the choices to go into maps and map making. Um, exactly. You you mentioned it was a, a snapshot and um, it so happens that it's also made from snapshots. Uh, and so I'm going to bring this up. You're going to talk about the photo? Uh, okay. Yeah, one of the pictures that Louise took, the, the maps on them say, you know, compiled from photos taken by Louise Boyd. And so I was curious what role she played in the map making and then also um, what you know about how you actually make maps from photographs like this. So there's, <laughs> I gather, many different photographs, like uh, hundreds of these photographs. Um, uh, like how does a map maker go about doing right. that? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, in anticipation of that, I studied up a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so we do have this really rich collection of photos that Louise took uh, on her expeditions. Uh, so the photos, uh, we have more than a thousand of them from uh, Greenland and uh, ranging in dates from 1928 to 1933. And this is just one, I went through a bunch of the pictures just to try to find one that would kind of highlight how they could be used and there's the, the importance of what they, what they contain. So Louise was uh, pretty much always the sole photographer on her expeditions and she uh, did not, well, she was not college educated. So anything that she did and anything she learned along the way to assist in the photography uh, and the map making was self-learned. So she taught herself photogrammetry, which is the act of making maps from uh, photos. And so that's basically why she took these photos. She took the photos um, as a means for going back and being able to, to map what they saw. So she wasn't, and, and they certainly were uh, also to document what they were seeing, but very heavily used in the map making um, process. 
when they got back from the expeditions. And so when I, I can't really talk about photogrammetry much because <laughs> it's a really complicated thing. And people who do photogrammetry spend many, many, many years studying it and learning it. <laughs> uh, but basically you take the photos and, and there you can take uh, photos like we take photos today and take a picture of some something. Uh, and then you can take photos from different angles, uh, oblique um, photography, and then you measure those and you compare those um, photos, you measure the angles, you observe what you see, and then you do, a, this is my really super simplified version of it, you do a lot of math, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you make the maps. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's uh, interesting because I think it's a part of what you're saying, I think, is that it, the principle of it is not that different than aerial photography, survey, correct. aerial photography surveys. Um, it's just a, a much um, uh, more acute angle. Uh, correct. Than, um, so that's I hadn't thought about that. That's interesting. <laughs> so it's you're also kind of getting the angle of, so mm -hmm. in this particular picture, she's clearly taking it um, straight on. But uh, she had uh, some cameras too that did, I didn't get enough, to, I didn't have enough time to read up on her cameras, but she mm -hmm. had specialized cameras that she used uh, that were able to take more oblique shots. Uh, mm -hmm. And from those oblique shots, you're able to um, measure angles and get um, the topography of a particular area that you're photographing. And so you don't have to be uh, on the land to, to measure the, the topography, you can use the photographs to do that. The photographs also show the, the glaciers, certainly that's one of the things that we're looking at here, but you also see the geology in the stratifications in this particular photo quite well. Um, and so then they're able to, to make some scientific guesses probably at this point in time, because to do the geology, you do have to touch the rocks but they can, mm -hmm. they can make some estimations of what type of rocks it is uh, just by looking at the photos as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, the way you're talking about it, it, it strikes me, Boyd's story strikes me as, um, you know, it stands out against, say, Marie Tharp, uh, who I think, at least in the map making community, is a, a more recognized name yeah. now than, than Boyd um, as someone that, um, as as many of you know, um, made some of the most persuasive maps and the first maps of the ocean floors um, and was also in her career frustrated by being uh, forbidden to go on the actual data gathering uh, right. missions in the Atlantic in the 50s. Um, and, you know, I think was, what's interesting here is, is a kind of almost reverse of that um, that's happening with Boyd. And the... I guess, yeah, I mean, I think you touched on a little how that some of that comes down to the money that she had. The money, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the uh, money bought her way in. Exactly. Um, and it's a, it's a different mode of, of map making and kind of um, as, as this exploration. I know that uh, Harvard had the Institute for Geographical Exploration, which was financed by a similar kind of um, rich person that liked... Um, like making maps. Um, the do you know what the what her um, kind of level of, of acceptance was in the AGS and how what it was like for her kind of doing this work as a woman? Yeah. So within the AGS, uh, she was well received. Um, they awarded her medals. You know, they published her work. They. She, I, I feel like within the AGS, she held a level of respect. With the scientists that she had on her expeditions, it was a little bit of a different story uh, because she was technically an uneducated woman. Um, mm -hmm. And when she, because she was paying for the expeditions, uh, she also then insisted that she was in charge. Uh, so she was the one who did all of the directing of all of these expeditions. So all of these men scientists on these expeditions had to take all of their direction from this uneducated woman. Uh, and 
I, I feel like that, you know, that you bring up Marie Tharp and the difference, like we know about Marie Tharp. And for us at the AGSL, Louise Boyd is, is a common name. It's, it's something that comes up for us on a very regular basis. But outside of our, our sphere, um, she's not well known, which is another reason why I wanted to talk about her today. Um, and it's, it's hard to really know why that, that came about because she, she did and, and sponsored really uh, progressive scientific work in the 1930s as a woman. So she's mentioned here and there in some books. Uh, there was a book that was published, I think it was either 2018 or 2019, that tells a more complete story of her. Uh, but it, it, it's amazing that people don't know who she is. Uh, but she was not necessarily treated very well by the, the scientists that she had on her ships. Uh, but she she did gain a lot of respect from people uh, off board. So mm -hmm. the AGS was certainly very respectful of her. And the, the United States government also recognized her uh, work by hiring her to do some work during World War, uh, just prior to the U.S. entering World War II. Uh, so they recognized the significance of it, even if um, her quote unquote peers did not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, I think, thinking, too, about the role of kind of citizen science in mapping, mm -hmm. uh, even in this period where um, national surveys have taken over a lot of the, the kind of work domestically. But then you have somewhere like Greenland, which is a little iffy in terms of uh, uh, <laughs> national sovereignty, and then it falls, right. it still falls on a kind of citizen science um, to do that. The, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you, too, is that the maps were published alongside and inside the ADS journal. Um, and my guess is that there are many libraries, I didn't have a chance to check my own, um, that have this journal, um, but have not cataloged the maps individually. And so I, I wonder how you think about your role as a curator in making maps like these that are hidden in journals. Uh, so they're much, much harder to find. Um, uh, where they are now, making those kind of maps uh, discoverable and, and interesting. I think that's part of what you're doing today. Yeah, so that's uh, absolutely something that I'm doing today. And it's a really great question because it's one um, that I struggle with on a regular basis. And when the AGS started the library in the 1850s, uh, and this went on, probably at least through the mid 1960s, uh, whenever we received items into our collection, uh, they would catalog, they'd make a, uh, the librarians would make a, a record for the actual item, uh, but then they would also make records for the maps and some of the pictures inside the books. And so we have still a giant card catalog in the AGS library, and we certainly are not adding to it anymore, but we are not getting <laughs> rid of it. Uh, and we use it on a very regular basis because it's this snapshot of our collection that is very complete uh, because mm -hmm. the librarians took the time to catalog those maps within the journals and within the books. Whenever we are looking for something, that's usually the first place we go because we, yeah. can, we know that it's going to tell us that. But as the, the influx of information into the AGSL, but libraries in general became too much to handle, we just stopped doing that. You know, you know like, so we'll make a record that's for, the, for a book. It just says, oh, there's some maps, but it's not telling you what the maps are. Uh, and so we do have a lot of these maps in our collection uh, where they are in things. And we try to be as conscious as we can in trying to create access to the maps that are in the either books or journals. So there are still some times uh, where we will pull maps out and we will catalog those maps separately and make a note that they belong to this other publication. We, and we, we've done that uh, for many things over the years. And it's something on some level, we can't do it to the level that we, I would love to, but on some level, we do still do that today. 
Um, no, it's great. It's a tough, it's a tough, uh, it's tough so problem. hard. <laughs> um, the, but I wanted to get to the interactive map. I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to bring it up here. So while um, you bring it up, I'm going to, I'll talk about it a little bit and we'll yeah. I'll talk about, um, how it came about. So one of the things that we are, have tried to do and are continue to try to do, and that I want to do more of is, is connect these pieces of the collections that we have. So our collections are really rich with uh, collections of things that, that are different formats, but belong together. Maps and photographs are uh, the best example of that. So how do we bring these two collections back together so they can tell the whole story that they were meant to tell. And this is a really great example of this. And I'm certainly going to give a shout out to Belle Lipton, who's the geospatial and cartographic information librarian at the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center for creating this lovely web map that you are now looking at. And so what this web map does is it takes uh, you'll, what you have up there on the screen is a manuscript map that Louise drew while she was sailing in East Greenland. Uh, and all of those very detailed notes are the numbers of, on the photographs that she took. So this is her taking photos, indicating which direction uh, the photo was taken in, um, and then it course, and on the photo when they were developed, she wrote the number on the photo. So what we did is we took all of those photos, or what Belle did, we took all of those, she took all of those photos and then mapped them. So you can now see where Louise was, uh, what the photo is that she took, and then if you change the overlay on that, you can see where in Greenland that was today and what that um particular place looks like in the picture that louise took and then what it looks like today and so this is really important uh because over the years we and particularly since we've put louise's collections online we have had a, a increase in requests for her photos um, to be used in a number of different scientific um studies. So last year we had some folks come from uh, the Greenland Ecosystem Monitoring Program out of our house University in Denmark. They found uh, Louise's photos through our digital collections. We pointed them to Bell's uh, web map so that they could see. So what they were wanting to do is do exactly what this is what this map was meant to do is to take those photos from the 1930s that Louise took and compare them with what the glaciers look like today so they can determine uh, the status of the glaciers and how much has been lost or how much has changed um, in the intervening years. Uh, last year, we also had uh, one of our research fellows who was uh, at the AGSL for a number of weeks looking at Louise's photos because she was uh, and is uh, recreating Louise's expeditions and she's going to she was coming to see what the photos looked like and then she's going to go out to Greenland and um, if she hasn't already and she's going to retake those photos uh, yeah that's, a, that's an intense project <laughs> she's, a, uh, she's another like a sort of independently wealthy lady who can do that yeah, yeah. Um, the I have more questions but I want to make sure we get to the questions yeah. uh, that are here. So um, the we'll get one from Julie. Um, so was Louise Boyd allowed to be a member of the AGS? She was. Easily answered. <laughs> um, so the AGS, yeah, I'll, I'll expand just a little bit. The AGS um, did so there, the, the AGS's treatment of women wasn't always uh, the best, uh, but they didn't ban women from being members. Yeah, um, and we have a, an insider question from from Bell. Um, how did they get all the photo equipment to Greenland in 1928? They put it on a boat, Bell. <laughs> <laughs> 
they didn't fly it there. Belle might, I yeah. think she, she might be asking me that question because she knows yeah. the answer. <laughs> yeah. And I don't yeah. know the answer. But I want to assume <laughs> that they put it on a boat and it, yeah. and it sailed there. Yeah, uh, leave Georgia, it Georgia's there. letting us know. Georgia's also letting us know that she was the first woman to the, the first, uh, Louise was the first woman elected to the AGS council. So yeah. uh, <laughs> Belle just admitted that she's trolling. Yeah. I knew you were. <laughs> Um, and what is the AGS Council? Oh, so the AGS Council, oh gosh, uh, is an elected board, I guess, is, the, is, is sort of a, it's, so it's an elected position that um, a geographer or, or somebody uh, affiliated with the AGS um, holds, and they kind of uh, provide oversight and direction of the day-to-day -day activities of the AGS. Still exists today. Um, I, can, I don't know off the top of my head how many members they have, et cetera. Yeah. Um, more, more women and, now. Yeah. Um, and are there any other um, projects or exhibitions you guys have going on that are coming up that, you're, uh, that you want to share with us? <sighs> Dreams of exhibition. I should have dreams, I suppose. Although all I feel like all my dreams are kind of going down the drain right now. Um, so we have. So if you go to our website, one we we have been developing a bunch of other web um, uh, applications. Uh, my my big thing is access. So I, all of the work that I do is always focused on how do we create better and you know, more creative access to our collections. Uh, so we have some uh, aerial photo finder uh, web apps that have been developed. Uh, one really cool one, I'm not sure if it's actually published yet or not, that highlights this really cool uh, photo, uh, aerial photo uh, project that we just sort of stumbled upon in the library. And the name, of course, is escaping me at this point in time. Um, and what is and your so, website? <laughs> I have to look. I have to look it up. If you just uh, search Google, if you ask the Google for the AGS yeah. library, um, right. or the American, if you just say AGS LUWM, it'll come up. Will be the first right. ones. It's a long. It's UWM.edu slash library slash AGSL. Just search Google right. for the AGSL. All right. Search your your, uh, your favorite search engine for so, uh, <laughs> all of the, use all of the search engines. Yeah. Um, great. And yeah, I think if there are any other questions uh, to your audience, uh, I'll throw them in the, the question mark box, but we're coming up on our, our half hour. So uh, thank you so much uh, for for coming and being a part of the the map time. Thanks for the, having me. Next week we're talking with uh, Bertie Mandelblatt, who's the George S. Parker, uh, the second curator of maps and prints at the John Carter Brown Library. Um, she'll be talking about a map, a really interesting map of Guyana. And the most important part about that announcement is that next week will be at 1 p.m. Eastern yeah. time instead of noon. Uh, and it will be at BPL Maps, uh, which is uh, who will be hosting. So Garrett will be hosting it uh, rather than me. We have one one question coming in under the wire. Um, so what were the lines of writing and symbols on the right side of the map you showed? Um, which, oh, which map? map? <laughs> um, if Joseph Charles can uh, tell us which map. Um, then we can answer that question more easily. Um, but some, so the lines, the lines in the manuscript map, if I understand correct, were the, were annotating the uh, where the pictures were taken, the numbers of the actual. Yeah. So if it's on, yeah. So if it's on the, the right, if it's on the um, the manuscript map, mm -hmm. yeah, it's so on the interactive one. So the on the manuscript map, the the lines along the what looks like well, what is the, the fjord that she is sailing in are, are just her kind of notations of what the topography looked like. 
so there's one that she she named it Curry Comb Peak. And it's just sort of like a, the draw, like I think she's just drawing that there was a mountain there. But then all of those annotations in the boxes, the numbers and the letters uh, are the key to the photos that she took when she was sailing in this area. So in the, in the, so in the box, you'll see that there's a number 23E2. Yeah, so then if you click on that in the interactive map, it shows you that photo. Uh, and then if you're, if you're using the web map, which you can get to um, on our website through our um, uh, geodata page, uh, you then can, you can click on and click through the photo into our digital collections. And then you can expand the photo and you'll see there's an annotation somewhere on the photo, usually at the bottom, either in the bottom center or on either of the corners, that is that number. And so that's how we know that that number that photo goes with that particular place on the map. Great. Um, awesome. Well, I think that we'll, we'll call it there. Uh, so again, thanks for coming. And thanks for uh, having me, we'll Dave. see you all. Yeah, we'll see you all next week at 1 p.m. Eastern at BPL Maps. All thanks, right. everybody, for tuning Have in. Bye.